Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good. Yeah, is everybody doing good? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. At least it's warm there. <laughs> so, uh, no, I want to thank everybody, uh, uh, especially uh, just to recognize, you know, all the all the people that came together to uh, to bring about this uh, amazing gathering. You know, I specifically want to recognize Sakura and, and the team that she's coordinated, uh, so that we could all come together and learn from one another. And, you know, put our minds and our hearts together to come up with a future for our children that's worthwhile. So I just want to recognize, uh, you know, the organizers of this conference. I also want to take the time to uh, recognize the traditional territory of the New Credit First Nation that I'm here in, um, and uh, to say that uh, as a guest, I'll walk lightly, and I'm thankful to be here. Bonjour, Dansi, Zongi Benesi, and Anantish Nakas, Kanuto Dem. Uh, as mentioned, I come from northern Manitoba, from the community of Pugatawagan First Nation. It's part of the Cree Nation. And uh, part of the responsibilities I carry uh, center around uh, an organization called the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, we've been around for the last 21 years, working across Turtle Island, what we call North America, from the north slope of Alaska all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, and in recent years all across Mother Earth, and our mission is to fight to protect the sacredness of our Mother Earth from toxic contamination and corporate exploitation. And our network is comprised of about 250 Alaska Native, First Nation, American Indian nations. Um, you know, and, and all of our work is really uh, kind of different, I guess you could say, than your standard environmental organizations. Uh, IEN is an environmental and economic justice organization. And uh, all of our staff, our board, our executive director, uh, are all Native people from impacted communities. And what I mean by that is from communities that have been uh, affected by this unsustainable <coughs> paradigm that we currently live in. And so, over the last 20 years, you know, we've been doing a lot of work supporting our nations to uh, continue to you know, build local sustainable economies fight against you know the evil doers that would contaminate our water poison our children all for the sake of making a buck and uh, you know in recent years a lot of our focus has been on energy issues um, it's important to understand that here in North America you know we have uh, a large majority of the fossil fuels that are extractable and by fossil fuels I mean coal conventional oil and gas, and unconventionals, of course, like tar sands or bitumen, located directly underneath our communities. And the governments of America and the United States in partnership with the private oil sector and King Coal, um, you know, have pretty much done everything that they can in, uh, in areas where they haven't corralled our people on Indian reserves. And so now, there is, uh, and for the last 10 years, there has been a disproportionate targeting of our native people's homelands, uh, you know, for unsustainable extractive industries. And so IEN, in response to this, and in response to the requests from our affiliates, our grassroots community members, the spiritual societies, and once in a while tribal councils, but, you know, more so individual families, grandmas, moms mostly, um, have asked us to you know, respond to this and to support them in their grassroots-led campaigns to try and shut down these operations or to stop new operations from popping up and further exacerbating the ecological and human health crisis that is unfolding in many of our territories. Now today I'm here to talk to you about the tar sands. How, how many of you have heard of the tar sands? All right, then I don't have to say anything. Hey, just kidding. Well, IEN, uh, through our Native Energy and Climate Program, we have our Tar Sands Campaign. It's known as the Canadian Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign. And we started about six years ago at the invitation of a, uh, a family in Fort Chippewan, which is a small community of 1,200, primarily Aboriginal people, but also people of settler backgrounds, uh, non-Native folks. Fort Chip is the oldest uh, 
non-native settlement in the province of Alberta. Um, and many people in that community have said that they might just be the first uh, municipality to become extinct in the province because of the tar sands and because of the horrific impacts that the tar sands contaminants coming downstream up the Athabasca River uh, from Fort McMurray where the tar sands is situated and bioaccumulating up the food chain, you know, it's caused a lot of cancers in the community. And since the last decade, there has been over 100 deaths from rare forms of cancer and autoimmune deficiencies uh, that many local people attribute uh, directly to the footprint of the tar sands operations. And so about six years ago, we had this family that has been, has a long history of activism in the territory come to one of our Protecting Mother Earth conferences. Now our Protecting Mother Earth conferences is the mechanism that we use to gain direction for our campaigns from our affiliates. And uh, you know, we had a lot of, about a dozen different First Nations and tribes from the US and Alaska talking about their, their fight against big oil. And a woman by the name of Lisa Deranger and Rose Desjarle stood up and said, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but y'all need to come and see the tar sands. And so six years ago, we flew up and went and checked out the tar sands and went and visited with some of the First Nations up in the Athabasca region of northern Alberta, which you can see here on the map on uh, the top right-hand corner. But tar sands isn't just in Athabasca. It's also in the Peace River region and in Cold Lake region. And there is about 177 billion barrels of recoverable oil, making Canada the third largest uh, reserves, proven reserves on the planet, um, next to Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. And that has put immense political, spiritual, social, and economic pressure on the Dene and Cree and Métis people who live in this region and who have subsisted off of the traditional foods, who have utilized the Athabasca River for time immemorial as a method of transport, it's a place to get their water, it's a place for their children to swim in, it's a place to get their fish, it's a place to pick their medicines. And what we're seeing now is the five First Nations in the region all having similar problems that Fort Chippewan has been reporting on through a very, very visible international indigenous-led campaign that many of you have probably seen. Uh, and participated in as a solidarity supporter. And so the tar sands, you know, being that it's so expansive, 140,000 square kilometers, uh, roughly the size of the state of Florida or the country of England and Wales combined, uh, you know, it's not your conventional type of oil. Situated underneath the boreal forest, the tar sands uh, of course, is uh, about 90% clay mixed with sand with about 10% bitumen, okay? Which shouldn't even really be called oil. It's actually an entirely different classification of fossil fuel unto it itself. It's very, very dirty uh, compared to conventional light, sweet, crude forms. Now to get at the tar sands underneath, the Boreal Forest, which is the second largest intact forest on the planet next to the Amazon, and also a critical carbon sink in the context of climate change. It's the lungs of our Mother Earth here in the north. It provides us with oxygen, <coughs> you know, provides us with the critical service that we need for our Earth systems to be healthy in terms of cleaning out the CO2 from our atmosphere. Well, because of the tar sands, the boreal forest is experiencing the second fastest rate of deforestation on the planet next to the Amazon. And this is because of the fact that they literally have to cut the trees down, remove streams, remove animals, remove people, remove communities, remove basically everything, including the mush keg, which they roll up like a carpet to get at this stuff. And it's in some places seeping right out of the ground go down the Athabasca River, you can see it coming out of the river banks. Um, and it's natural, you know, it's a natural deposit. Tribes of old age used to use it to patch up their canoes, all right? So it's all over the place. If left undisturbed, it doesn't really poison everybody. 
Um, but now there's an area about the size of equal land mass of Vancouver Island that has been disturbed for the pro purposes of strip mining this stuff, where it's economically viable to strip mine it. Um, so they're around the city of Fort McMurray, um, hold on. Around the city of Fort McMurray, if you go around there, you'll see a whole horrific landscape that looks like, I don't know, a desert or the surface of the moon with no life. And uh, what's happening there basically is the strip mining operations. Now about 20% of those 177 billion barrels I was talking about are recoverable through the process of strip mining. And that's what you've been seeing all over the news and everything, and National Geographic and all that. And it's really horrific. And it's economically viable for them to strip mine about you know, 300 feet below the surface of the Boreal Forest. After that, it becomes uneconomically viable. And so they have to use another process of it, extraction technology called SAG-D, or in situ, Latin for in-place extraction, which is actually way more carbon intensive and actually impacts the forest in a much different way by creating thousands of kilometers of roads, of pipelines, of collector stations, of pumping stations in the region. The 80% of this deposit um, is what they're now leasing out. And this is areas in the, in the region that they have to use this other type of extraction technology, which is not only more carbon intensive because they have to burn vast amounts of natural gas but it's also water intensive because they have to burn that natural gas to create super hot steam that they inject through pipes deep into the earth, melt the bitumen down in the deposits, and then suck it back up through another pipe using gravity to assist that process. Now what this does is, you know, through the realities of our global climate crisis, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of, of positive feedback cycles. And one of them is the spruce pine beetle. Okay, how many of you heard of the spruce pine beetle? Well, the forest has a natural defense against these nasty little critters. And because our climate is warming up in Canada, these little guys, gals, these little beetles, they now uh, have babies not once a year, but two or three times a year, okay? And they kill the forest uh, from the top down. And uh, you know, when you build roads and cutways and pipelines through the forest and fracture the forest's integrity, those are super highways for the beetles, all right? And so it exacerbates the positive feedback, negative impacts of climate change by you know, giving these beetles even more entry into the forest. As, you know, and they've killed millions of hectares of trees all the way from Southeast Alaska to Alberta. They're now being found in Saskatchewan, and eventually they will make their way here to Ontario, if they're not here already. Now, I'm just bringing up all of this stuff so that you know what we're talking about um, when I get to the campaigning part. All of this stuff is happening, you know, in those mines, there are trucks that, are, that carry 300 ton tons per load. They're the size of a three-bedroom uh, house, Okay, imagine a three-bedroom house on wheels driving around. That's the size of these trucks. There are hundreds of them in the mines, driving 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and they're being filled up by the world's biggest earth movers. These earth movers are these electric shovels. They're, you know, they're about 10 stories high, and they too are operating 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Um, so, vast amounts of energy. On the Insutu operations and, and throughout the tar sands, throughout all the different mines and the upgraders, they burn 600 million cubic feet of natural gas every single day. That's enough to heat 2.4 million Canadian homes. And you know it's cold as shit here in Canada, and you know our homes are really big. And Canadians are, you know, energy pigs. So, do the math. Every single day they move enough earth in the tar sands to fill up the Toronto Sky Dome. Okay? Already, they've moved enough earth in the tar sands uh, that is larger in quantity than the Great Pyramids of Giza or whatever, the Suez Canal, the Great Wall of China, the 10 largest dams on the planet combined. It's the world's largest construction project ever in the history of mankind, and it's happening in northern Alberta. It requires 77,000 workers to make it go every single day. 55,000 of those workers come from maritime provinces and are flown in for three-week cycles, thousands of kilometers across the land. 
one conspiracy theory that I'll put out to you is you wonder why this government will not allow Air Canada workers to strike? It's because 55,000 of the tar sands workers needs Air Canada to get 